Hello again, this is Beginner's Guide to GPG, Lesson 6, Advanced GPG Theory. Um, in this lesson we'll pretty much be talking about every other part of GPG. You'll see why it's fairly complex. Some of it might be hard to understand. Don't feel ashamed to watch this video again. Key servers. Key servers host public keys for each email address. This allows people to easily download your latest public key from the command line or NIC mail interface instead of asking you for it. All of the key servers mirror each other, so if you upload a public key to one, pretty soon all of the key servers will have it. I think it takes like 5 to 10 minutes to update. The upside is people who have never met you can look up your email and then GPG with you. The downside is anyone can upload a public key under your email, so you must be cautious of what keys are uploaded under your email address, and if the keys you download are actually legitimate. That's why verification is important if you use keys from key servers. You definitely want to verify and sign that key. Some websites you can use to browse key servers. To use these, you would just copy the UID line from your GPG list, which you can generate with that command in the brackets. Verification. So we've exchanged public keys and encrypted messages. That's good enough, right? No. Anyone can upload a public key under your email address to a key server. Eavesdropper could also intercept your mail and insert a fake public key. We have no way of knowing that the public keys we've received are in fact linked to the recipient's, real recipient's private key. Uh, this is why verifying public keys is absolutely essential. So how can you be sure that you have the right key? Fingerprinting. Fingerprinting allows us to generate a string of hexadecimal units that represent our public key. We can then compare these digits in person, or over the phone, or by snail mail. Your fingerprint is 40 de hexadecimal digits long. Your key ID is basically the last eight digits of that, but nowadays people use long key IDs, which are the last 16 digits of that fingerprint. Awesome. So that basically means you can either compare the whole fingerprint or you can just compare the long ID if you want. If you're lazy, but it's usually good to check the whole thing. How to view your fingerprints in Enigmail. So we've already seen Enigmail, but how do we view our fingerprints in it? To do that, in key management, we right-click the key and we select key properties. And we'll have a column here for fingerprints. So we view that, copy it, and compare it to what the other person has for this key. And we do that with both our key and their key. And that's basically how verification works. Identification. If we work for the same company and you know we've both got employee ID tags or we've known each other for a long time like we're lifelong friends, it'll be really easy to be sure that we, we are actually who we say we are. Uh, like I say I'm Eamon Collins, how do you actually know that? If you didn't know me previously. So what if we've never met? In that scenario it's really important that uh, you have someone vouch for your identity or that you check legal documents like driver's licenses, passports, etc. So you can be 100% sure that that person is actually who they say they are. Trust. GPG allows you to set the trust level when signing a person's public key. This represents how confident you are that they can verify keys and you G use GPG properly themselves. There are five numbers that represent the trust level. One is, I don't wanna, I don't wanna set a level, no thank you. Two is, I do not trust this person at all. Three is, you trust them marginally. Then finally, fully, and number five is ultimately. If you know someone is really bad at verifying keys, they're a bit sloppy with their GPG usage, then you would assign them a lower score, like two or three. If you're signing my key, you would probably use like a 4 or 5 since I'm an awesome GPG user. Um, but yeah, then again, if you don't live in Perth, we wouldn't have done verification. So you could set that lower if you wanted. <clears throat> More on trust. We are 
we're using GPG properly and we may have verified our keys properly so we can be 100% sure it's working right um, but can you actually trust the people you're working with not to betray you Ooh, that's a topic that's outside this course and I won't really touch on but it's something you should think about if you're using GPG for security signing keys signing keys after verification, it's always a good idea to sign that person's public keys. This tells your GPG software that you have looked at that key, you have verified it. If you then try to send me a message with an unverified public key, uh, GPG will basically warn you and it'll say, hey, this isn't the key that you signed before, this is some other key that they're using. And then you can choose not to trust the contents of that message. After verifying and signing the key on your computer, it must be exported and imported to replace the author's public key. So once you sign a person's key, it doesn't just magically reappear in their own key ring as, um, as a signed key. You basically have to give it back to them and they have to import it back into their own key ring. So how do we do that? Signing a key in an email. To do that, we just go key management, then right click and choose sign key to set trust level very similar key management right click your key your um your partner's key and then set set owner trust you can then export the key you signed to a file in the same menu the second one from the top uh, you can then also import the key that your partner signed for you and that they've given to you so if they give you your key back and they say, hey, I signed this for you, you would import that as well by going uh, file. So that's not actually in this menu, that's here, file, then import keys to file. Awesome. Activity 14, remember when we compared fingerprints last lesson? Well, we didn't um, because most of you don't live in Perth. Uh, if you have a partner or a group of people that you're doing this with um, it's a it's an extremely good idea to compare fingerprints with them and to sign their keys so do that um, but if you do live in Perth you can actually do this with me let's just say you do hypothetically although you probably don't um, that would allow us to verify each other's fingerprints and then sign each other's keys and exchange them groovy so yeah get to it Sign them keys, send them, import them, update them, do it, it's important. So you have signed your keys, signing messages, you can also sign messages, whoa that's a bit confusing, you can sign keys and you can sign messages. Yeah, you should always sign your messages when using GPG. When signing a message, your private key is used to make a digital fingerprint that accompanies the message. This has two advantage. Two advantages. You can be sure that the message has not been modified in transition, and you can also verify who sent it using that signature. An email does not sign messages by default, but you should set it so that it does. I know the default settings on an email they're not really what we want them to be. If an imposter is trying to send you a fake message, they will forget to sign their own their own message and they will basically just use your public key. You should avoid trusting communications that are not signed. Drama. How to sign a key in an email. Here we see, again, that gold, gold emblem provides the encryption, but the golden pen provides the signing. So that's how we do it. And we'll be prompted to enter our passphrase when we do that. Sending an email to always sign private messages. This is really important. To do that, you basically go menu, enigmail, then preferences. Then you click display expert settings and menus. This will change a fair amount of the menus in enigmail. You're free to change it back afterwards if you don't like it. You should exit that window and then proceed to actually write an email. This is a bit tricky because you can only get to signing and encryption options by writing an email and then clicking an email in this top bar here. 
So after doing that, you'll basically see this menu. Check, sign messages by default, like it has done there. If you want, you could also go a bit rogue. You could instead select um, sign encrypted messages. So instead of signing all the messages, it would only sign ones that are GPG. This might be desirable if you have contacts who uh, aren't using GPG and they would probably get scared if you sent them a big block of PGP code. Fair enough, but um, I choose sign messages by default, so it always does it. And that leaves it so people can ask you what it is and get in a GPG that way if you want. Activity 15, set Enigma to sign messages by default. Okay, I'm actually going to show you how to do this because it's important. That's the one. So, we go Enigma and then preferences. Then we select display expert settings and menus. Awesome. Wonderful, now we would go to write a message, then we would go Enigma, preferences, signing and encryption options. Here we go. So, as we see, I don't have it set up, so let's just click that, sign messages by default. Awesome. Okay, so now we see the message is automatically on. It's automatically signed every time. That's really important when using GPG, so be sure to do that yourself. Okay, moving back to the actual lecture. Revocation. If we have uploaded a key to a public key server, how do we ensure the real owner can remove that public key when they need to? Revocation certificates are the answer to this problem. A unique revocation certificate is created and kept secret by the creator in an offline store, like a CD or USB drive like we discussed and you should have done yourself. Uh, they can then remove the key from public key servers and declare it officially revoked if they want. This is very important. Um, it's very important to hold on to your revocation certificate, like I said. If I was to look up your email account on a public key server and see that there were multiple keys and some of them aren't revoked, this would signify that another person may have created and uploaded a public key under your name, under your email address. It also might mean that you're sloppy and you haven't been revoking your keys and you're not a very good GPG user. I would be forced not to trust new public keys. You should not trust new public keys. If some random new public key comes up on a key server and nobody signed it, don't trust it. It could be someone else. It could be an imposter. If you want to be really secure, I just cut out the key servers entirely and tell people to email you if they want you to send them a new key. How to revoke a certificate in Enigma. So we've got a certificate that we've been using for a very long time and we want to get rid of it. Um, so to do that we basically just go revoke the key. Right click in key management and go revoke. That would then prompt you to select the revocation certificate. After that, you would actually want to upload it to a key server as well if you were using a key server. Moving along, expiration. What happened if we used a key pair forever? Well, we would run the risk of someone finding our private key and decrypting our messages. This is why keys expire. When you create a key pair, you specify an expiry date in which the public key is considered expired. People will disregard your key after that. The default key expiry is two years. You can say your, or maybe it's three years, you can set yours to be shorter if your application requires higher security. So if you were using like, if you wanted extreme security, you would use like three or six months. Something really, really low. How to check your own expiry date in Enigma. So you're wondering, when is my key gonna run out? Easy, just right click in key management and select properties. Then in this window, you can see the expiry in this column here. Easy peasy. Verifying downloads. Besides encryption, it's also possible to use GPG to, to check the integrity of a download. This is done by importing the file author's public key, verifying that key if it's possible, if you're even able to reach them, uh, or comparing it with what other people think it is. Q 
comparing the key and then you basically compare uh, the key with the downloaded file and the signature that they've created for it. So this is often used with software developers when they want people to be uh, have file verification for let's say a Linux distro or a piece of software and they want you to they want to be extremely certain that you get the correct uh, final copy. GPG is really good for that. Here's an example steps for verifying a file. Uh, this is, uses the Tails ISO file. To do this, we would import the key file first using this command GPG2 key ID format long import Tails signing dot key. We would then download that sick file and verify the ISO file with GPG2. Yeah, you can read it. <laughs> So what that's basically saying is it's saying get the signature for this particular file that I've downloaded and compare it to the author's GPG key, his public key, so I can be certain that it is actually from him. If it's successful, you'll see something like that. Note that mine says it's not a trusted signature. That's because I didn't do the verification myself. I don't know anyone who develops tales. Yeah, there's a bit more on the Tails website on how to do verification, uh, even if you don't, even if you're not able to contact the authors personally. Activity 16, I'm not going to show you this, but it's a good idea if you want to practice file verification using GPG, is to try it with the Tails ISO because their guide is really good on their website. So give that a spin, see if you can do that. Other links, detailed guides on GPG, definitely worth a read. Thanks for watching.